The story of Noah and the ark is a story that we are very familiar with, and we heard, but probably when we were far younger. The story of Noah is a story we hear when we're in vacation Bible school or, or when we're in Sunday school as youth. The story that, the way that we are told, uh, the story of Noah and the ark, it's a story that we are very familiar with, but probably familiar with it from hearing it long ago in vacation Bible school or in Sunday school when we were, when we were younger. And the way that the story is told in that context is, uh, well, God tells Noah to build an ark, and he does. He does as he is told. It rains. Noah gets in the ark. After a while, Noah gets out of the ark when a, a dove lands in, in, the, in the ark holding a twig, and so he knows that something is growing again, and, and that's how it goes. We decorate nurseries with this story, right? My, my daughter has a plush Noah, a plush ark, Noah's Ark with animals you can play with and put into it, and the giraffe's head sticks out, and it's next to the, the rhinoceros and, and, the, and all of the other animals you can. And it's very cute, it's very fun, it's very bright and soft and fuzzy. We read it as adults and we start to take the story a bit more seriously, and we think about what happened, and we start to realize the details are telling us something a bit harder, right? The, there's a reason that Noah doesn't open the window. Uh, Noah gets in the ark in chapter 6. He doesn't open the window of the ark for a long time, right? The, after the flood has fully happened. <clears throat> we don't hear about it in chapter 7. He opens the window. Why didn't he open the window earlier? Well, there were a lot of livestock, a lot of animals, or people. And their bodies did not just go away. It was a hard, hard thing. I don't think I'd want to look at it either. But the story still ends with a promise. It still ends with a promise that an entire civilization will not be wiped out like that again. Look to the rainbow. That's the sign of God's promise. Right. Now, as we continue to wade through these waters, it gets, it gets the waters get a bit deeper, right? It gets a little more challenging to read this because we start to notice more details. It's not just the window and when he opens it. <coughs> There's also the detail about... Uh, Noah puts in seven pairs of the animals that are the cl animals that are clean and two, a set of animals, only two each of the animals that are not clean. And clean, well, clean is an understanding based upon what the Jewish people should eat. <coughs> and God doesn't teach the Jewish people what to eat till they are in the wilderness, down the road. That's like Leviticus. That's way down the road. Right? That's after slavery and Moses and, and all of that. Right? This is back, this is Noah. How would Noah know what is clean or not? Well, I mean, that drives us to think about when this story was written. And as we had talked about a few weeks ago, when this story was written, it's when the Jewish people are in exile in Babylon and they are uh, scared. They're scared about their future. They're going through their own flood type event. And so they're writing down the stories that make them who they are so that their children will know. And, and so as they're writing them down, this is a story they would have been sure to write down. It's a story of, of how the Jewish people, or how, how God saved the pe of some people through the flood, right? Noah's family. And there was a sign of the rainbow that it would never be that bad again. And so they would tell this story, and, and they'd use the language they knew, clean and unclean animals, when they were talking about what no, animals Noah took with him. But this would be a story they would want to make sure to tell so that they could remember that it would never be that bad again. It would never just be one family. There, there was hope for the Jewish people that they would get through this particular catastrophe. We keep on reading, and we, we can start asking practical questions, right? Could, could Moses have actually built this boat? Maybe. I don't know. What, what, how big was the flood? Was it a local event, or was it a worldwide event? I mean, if it was a worldwide event, if, if the whole world was flooded, there would have been nowhere for the waters to recede. And so it had to have been a local event. And all the ancient cultures of that time recorded some event with a flood. A lot, something got very wet, right? 
And so that God called Noah to build a boat and get in it because there was a flood coming. You know, that, that's, that's the miracle. Some, a lot of times in Scripture, the miracle is not what happens. It's that you know it's about to happen. And so, so for, for Noah to be able to get his farm together, pack it up, and, and, and take a boat, build a boat, and save the farm, save his family from the, this, this flood, uh, yeah, yeah that's, that's, I think something like that happened. But as we continue to wade through these waters, we go from wading to the point where we are actually floundering. And we start floundering, and you know, this is a good time of any for me to tell you how much I hate being in the water, and I feel like I'm floundering when the water... Those of you who have glasses know what happens when you get in the water. Your glasses come off, and you stop being able to see anything. I, I'm actually going from memory right now because I can't see my notes this far away from my, my face. I, I hate being in the water. I, I hate being underwater. I hate opening my eyes in the water. I hate not being able to see. I hate how my eyes burn right when I'm underwater and I open them. I distinctly remember... Um, Ten-year-old Andy, I was at my Uncle Roy's, and I'm going to swim across the pond, or swim to the middle of the pond where there's a small island, because I'm ten, that's what you do. It's a deep pond, though. And as I'm swimming, and I don't have my glasses on, so I can't see, and I'm swimming, I put my head under the water, and I look, and it's a deep pond, and what happens in a deep pond is it goes dark. And now I have a problem, because I hate to have my head underwater but I'm even more scared of what could be in the deep, in the black. What I can barely see and what I can see is dark. And this is in North Florida. That's a pertinent detail. I'm in North Florida. There are things in the water you need to watch for. <laughs> and so I, there's this, I just distinctly remember that sense of floundering and worrying and feeling awkward. And, and that's what I start to feel like as we wade into these waters. I don't like it. Right? It gets hard. Because I start reading what Jewish people have to say about this. Right? The Jewish people have, have, as of late, experienced a catastrophic flood type event themselves. It's called the Holocaust. There's this, we've, many of us have watched the movie about the Holocaust called Schindler's List, about Oscar Schindler, a man who saved people. The original story, one of the original options for the name of that movie was Schindler's Ark. And I think that would have been far better. The idea of, of gathering people to ride out what was about to happen. All right. How can a Jewish person look at the rainbow and hold on to the promise that God will not do that again after the Holocaust? God judged the times, we read. God judged the times and God regretted. Regretted that God had made humanity. Like, how does that work? In, in the creation, we read that God had created, day one, God created, oh, that's good. Day two, created, oh, that's good. Day three, good, right? You get, day six, ooh, humanity, very good, right? Wonderful, profoundly good. And here we are, not that far down the road, and God regrets how much damage, how bad does humanity have to get before God regrets? We read that Noah is righteous for his generation. How often does that last part of a phrase matter so much? Right? I love you, I think. Right? I'll be there. I may be a few minutes late, right? That last phrase, the last part of the phrase matters. Noah wants a righteous man for his generation. What is it? Like, if he'd been in David's generation, he would have been kind of this run of the mill. If he'd been in Abraham's generation, he'd been kind of whatever. But if you look at him compared to Abraham, Abraham is righteous, and Abraham is respected, and Abraham, like, what do you think of Abraham? Abraham is the guy who, when God says, I'm going to take out a town, this city of Sodom, what does Abraham do? He goes to bat for people he doesn't know. 
God, if you don't do something, I mean, if there are, if, if, you, if you find 30 people there, right, if you find 30 people there, you have got to spare them. Well, no, 20, 10, if you find 10 people, like Abraham is arguing and haggling with God to save people. He knows his brother down there, but the rest of the people he does not know. And then we got Noah, right? Noah, like he doesn't say anything to God about this. Like Noah doesn't say to God, you know, the, our, our neighbors down the road, the Andersons, you know, they're kind of frustrating, I know. You regret them, I know, but like they're my neighbors. They've loaned me milk before. Can we take them at least? Right? Is Noah a hero or is he a wimp? Right? Why doesn't Noah ask about anyone else? Noah is on the ark for a long time comes off the ark, right? He goes on, he's on the ark for a long time. I mean, just consider it. It's like your worst trip. Are we there yet? Times a million. Right? He's on there a long time, raising kids, lots of animals, but then he gets off the ark, and the first thing he does is he builds an altar, makes a sacrifice. Good idea. Thank you, God. And then he plants a vineyard, makes some wine, and he gets hammered, toasted, drunk. He gets so drunk that he blacks out naked. We know that because we hear about his son finding him naked, not doing anything about it, and the other two sons covering him up, and then the two sons tattle on the first son. Some things never change. But he gets just totally obliterated drunk. What has happened that that was what made sense for him to do? Right? What part of what made Noah righteous was damaged by him being on the boat while his neighbors died and while he waited it out? Right? Does he have some sort of like survivor's guilt? Does Noah have PTSD? Right? How broken is Noah? This is the point at which if I had any clue how to answer any of these questions, there'd be like two more pages of sermon, right? But I just don't know. We don't hear much out of Noah, and maybe his silence is a really good example. We hit these questions, and we're floundering through the water, and we just don't know. And we're hoping to see a rainbow. I'm hoping to believe that God is big enough to face our anger, even when the waters swirl. Right? And it's in that spirit that I remember a story of uh, there's some rabbis who after the Holocaust, they put God on trial. Right? They put God on trial. They, they, they sit down, they get out scripture, and they study scripture together all day. And they say, can we defend God from the Holocaust? From what has happened here? And at the end of the day of arguing and debating and reading, they decide that God is guilty. They decree God is guilty. They have found him guilty, convicted him. And then they stand up and dust themselves off. And they say, okay, now it's time to go lead evening prayer. And they go to their congregations and they lead evening prayer. This is just great, right? It's great. Because it shows these rabbis understand something that, that I think we, we need to understand as well, that faith is a journey even when you're angry at the person you're journeying with. Is our faith a brick wall that is built or a journey that we're on? If it's a brick wall and we're, we build our faith as like brick, 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 and in Bible verse, doctrine, opinion, reason, this sermon, and we build this brick wall, and if something comes along and kicks out some bricks, what happens to the wall? It falls. But if faith is a journey, and we're following, and we're heading somewhere, heading towards that rainbow, and something comes along and gives us a swift kick, what do we do? Well, we limp, but we keep on, we keep on going. We keep on journeying towards that rainbow. The rainbow is the first sign of the first covenant, the, the covenant uh, that, that God will not cause this catastrophe to happen again. 
And it's not the first, it's not the last covenant. There's the covenant of Abraham that you you will be a bless you are blessed to be a blessing, a father of many nations. There's the the covenant with David that you your your line will be a line of kings. There's the the new covenant, the covenant Jesus makes. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. Right? And we are people of a covenant, and a covenant is a relationship. And I cannot promise you that this relationship, that this journey that we are on is cut and dry. It actually can be rather wet and messy. But I think we can continue to walk it. Because in the end, we are not saved by our, intell by our intellectual comprehension. We're not saved because we can answer all the questions. We are saved because we follow Jesus. We are saved because we keep on heading towards the rainbow. We're saved because as people of faith, we keep on following Jesus. Thank God. Thank God. Amen.